Hello, welcome to your online lecture for the course Pathophysiology 1. In today's lecture, we're covering cervical cancer. I pulled this slide from our first lecture just to remind you of the different types of adaptation that exist because part, parts of adaptation are relevant to cervical cancer or the development of cervical cancer. This is a drawn image, of course, of cells and how they might look microscopically if we were to observe them within a tissue. In this first image, we have that normal layer of simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, uh, all lined on a, on a basement membrane. And then we're going to show you what happens in different cases of adaptation to that layer of cells. In the case of atrophy, this is where there's a decrease in cell size, and you know that if enough cells in an organ decrease, then the entire organ itself atrophies or decreases in size. With hypertrophy, you can note the opposite effects of atrophy where there's an increase in size. Another type of adaptation is hyperplasia. This refers to an increase in cell numbers, so remember compared to our layer at the top. Metaplasia refers to a few different changes, but noted primarily was a change in cell type. We talked about that a lot in our last class, and we'll, we'll apply that to cervical cancer today. And lastly, dysplasia, which we'll also, we'll also be talking about when we speak of cervical cancer, I had mentioned really refers to a deranged type of cell growth. And you might recall that it is related to hyperplasia in a lot of ways, and so it's sometimes referred to as atypical hyperplasia. You also heard me refer to dysplasia as, as atypical metaplasia, but remember it is not a true adaptive process. Again, this image comes from your first lecture when we talked about adaptation. Now, this is bronchial tissue that we spoke about in detail about the changes that can occur in bronchial tissue when there's chronic, chronic irritation or injury, such as what would happen from, from chronic smoking. But even though this is of the bronchial tissue, the same sort of changes are noted within the cervix. Cervical dysplasia is the replacement of some epithelial cells of the cervix by atypical neoplastic cells. Neoplasia is just defined as new growth. So you can get the formation of neoplasms throughout the body, which are really tumors, new growth. And it is staged depending on the depth of epithelial involvement. So how many layers are involved? Risk of progression to invasive carcinoma will rise steadily with the severity of the dysplasia. When, once we get to the cancer unit, we'll talk a lot more about what invasive carcinoma really is, but you will get a basic answer in today's lecture. A woman that has an intact immune system is likely to resolve dysplasia on its own. And another point to make is that at least a third of all lesions that are present of dysplasia will actually persist for a long period of time without actually progressing or regressing. They just, they just exist. This here is a reminder of normal anatomy of the female reproductive system. So I'll just review a few things that are relevant and, and then let you know what parts of the normal anatomy you need to be aware of for this, this topic in patho. So we have the vagina. At the top of the vagina, we have the cervix, and here's the opening to the cervix, which is actually called the external os of the cervix. Then we have the endocervical canal, and then we have the internal os of the cervix. So this entire structure here is the cervix, and it has two openings and a canal within it. And so I would like you to be aware of these details that are highlighted here under the cervix of the uterus. Then we have the uterus itself. The uterus has that endometrial lining that sheds during menstruation. It has that muscle layer as well that's, for example, very much involved in childbirth. And then we have the fallopian tubes, one on each side, or the uterine tubes. And these lead to the ovaries, which you can see are suspended. And these ovaries will then produce eggs and then the eggs will be released 
at ovulation and they will travel then into the fallopian tube and they're usually fertilized in and around this region or the outer third of the uterine tube if they're going to be fertilized. And then of course make their way through here into the uterus where they embed themselves into the, it's embedded into the wall and then pregnancy begins. But as far as terms you need to be aware of, we spoke about the internal and external os of the cervix and in particular that endocervical canal. The cervix really acts as this mechanical barrier to infectious microorganisms that could enter into the vagina. And so this opening here actually contains a thick sticky mucus or a mucus plug that exists during parts of the female cycle as well as through pregnancy really to act as a barrier of those infectious microorganisms that will inevitably enter the area. So here's where we get into some important information relating to cervical cancer. The endocervical canal that I mentioned a couple of times, it doesn't have the, the same endometrial layer that the uterus has, but it is lined with what are called columnar epithelial cells. So these are cells that are columnar in shape, columns, they're, they're more stretched, they're longer, they're taller. This layer here is continuous with the lining of the outer part of the cervix, which is lined with a different type of cell called squamous epithelial cells. So again, we have columnar cells and then we have squamous cells. The point at which these two types of cells meet, so the, the, the columnar and the, and the squamous, is called the transformation zone or the squamous columnar junction for obvious reasons. It is the transformation zone where these two cell types meet that is vulnerable to a particular type of virus, HPV or human papillomavirus. In particular, types 16 and 18 or strains 16 and 18. And these types of HPV can lead to dysplasia and it can also lead to carcinoma in situ, which means cancer in place. And we'll look at that again a little bit later. Cells of the transform transformation zone are routinely removed with pap tests, pap smear tests. So if you're a female, you will very likely know what a pap test is and hopefully you've had one, at least one in your life. And then these cells can also be looked at to see if they contain HPV. This transformation zone is also where the endocervix and the ectocervix meet. So what we can say is that this is the endocervix and then out here is the ectocervix. Endo means within, so this is within the cervix and then ecto means without. And as we'll see later, because it's the transformation zone that is most vulnerable to the effects of HPV, which can lead to dysplasia and cancer, it's very important during a pap test that the proper correct tissue is actually removed for analysis. This image here of the cervix shows you the normal transformation zone of the cervix and up close it's quite evident. You can see where these cells, this lighter region, meets up with this darker region, the transformation zone. What's interesting is that the transformation zone actually changes throughout the female's life. So that means it's sort of like a moving target where it can be very difficult to to ensure that you're getting the correct tissue during a pap test because of its movement throughout life. The transformation zone is really an area then of changing cells, changing cell types. And it's the most common place for abnormal cells to develop. So what do I mean that it's an area of constantly changing cell type? Well, I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. First, remember that the two main cells of the cervix involve the columnar epithelial cells within the cervix. And then as we get outside the cervix, we have the, the squamous epithelial cells. And that that line that they meet is the transformation zone. And this area is very vulnerable to the oncogenic, meaning the potential to cause cancer, effects of human papillomavirus. And so that's the most likely place if it's going to develop for cancer to develop. In this zone, columnar epithelial tissue is constantly being replaced 
by squamous epithelial tissue via metaplasia because we know metaplasia is a change of cell type. So what's happening then is the columnar cells are being replaced by squamous cells. It, and because of that, it gets the name squamous cell metaplasia, not columnar cell metaplasia, but squamous cell metaplasia. And of course, metaplasia, especially if it becomes atypical, is prone to dysplasia. Metaplasia is, especially when we talk about the cervix, is thought to be affected by hormone levels. These metaplastic cells or cells that have undergone metaplasia, they're actually at an increased risk of incorporating foreign or abnormal genetic material within their DNA. And that's why neoplastic changes or new growth is most common at the transformation zone. It's just a very vulnerable area. This here is showing you cervical carcinoma in C2, meaning cancer in place. And you wouldn't have to identify it in an image, but this is just an example. This is a scanning electron uh, microscope view. And just finally, this is summarizing the different stages of a female's life with hormonal involvement. And remember, I'd mentioned earlier that the the presence of, of hormones or the, the presence of, of hormones at different times throughout life can lead to metaplasia and also the changing location of that transformation zone. There are different gradings of cervical epithelial change. This diagram of cervical cells shows the progressive degree of what's called CIN or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, you can also make note, is also called cervical dysplasia, also known as cervical dysplasia. And it's the abnormal growth of cells on the sur surface of the cervix that could potentially lead to cervical cancer. We could say more specifically that CIN or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia really refers to potentially precancerous transformation of the cervix. In the first image here, you can see normal squamous epithelium. But when dysplastic changes begin, it can be graded depending on the level of change as either one CIN1, two, or three, or mild, moderate, and severe, respectively. Women with CIN1, also known as, and I have it written at the bottom here, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, so LSIL, have a, a mild dysplasia. So their chance, you don't need to know the statistics, but just to give you an example, these women would have about an 11% chance of progression to CIS, which is carcinoma in C2. Women with CIN2 or high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion have moderate dysplasia and they have about a 22% chance of progression to carcinoma in C2. CIN3 or high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, so you can see high-grade is both CIN2 and CIN3, almost all all or most of the cervical epithelial tissue so shows cellular features of carcinoma, but the underlying tissue, the basement membrane, is not penetrated, it's not affected. Carcinoma in C2 is generally a precursor to invasive carcinoma. That means that the cancer has invaded the basement membrane. CIN3, you should be aware, is not cancer, and I know that in this image it is deceiving, but in an upcoming slide, you'll see the different levels that exist of CIN3 before technical progression to carcinoma in C2. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this to explain it further. Just a comment about pap tests. Pap tests make the rate of cervical cancer rather low in developed countries provided you actually get a pap test because you're not you don't you're not going to have symptoms to indicate that there is an issue such as as dysplasia so this is a very important consideration for developing countries where they don't have access to the the proactive screening that pap tests offer 
So once again, CIN3 does not necessarily indicate cancer. We're going to look at the different levels or different degrees that exist with CIN3. But if it was to metastasize or spread, so somebody had carcinoma in C2 and then it invaded the basement membrane and it spread, some of the likely locations of METs would exist in the ureters of the urinary system, into the lateral pelvic walls, the vagina, and the uterus, areas that are, are relatively close to where the cervical cancer exists. So you've heard me mention the pap test a couple of times already, but what exactly is it? The pap test involves non-invasive collection of cervical, cervical cells from the surface of the cervix during a pelvic examination. So a speculum is used to allow for easier visualization of the cervix, otherwise it's difficult to properly collect samples. So a speculum is just a, a medical tool that widens the walls of the vagina for better visibility. Cervical cytology examination, so examination of the cells of the cervix, is most accurate if cells are obtained from both the endocervix and the ectocervix, which is what we spoke about on a previous slide. So this requires that the collection device is actually placed into the cervical os, so into here, because we have our endocervix and our ectocervix. And then these cells, once collected, are sent to the laboratory for analysis. And when dysplasia is detected, then further testing is going to be indicated for a most appro more appropriate diagnosis. Women should be screened for cervical cancer and risk for future cervical cancer through pap tests, but also HPV tests. HPV is often detectable, interestingly enough, for more than a decade before any noticeable cellular changes occur. So it can be contracted in the 20s and may not actually show changes until the 30s. For women that are over the age of 30 but under the age of 65, HPV testing is, is especially in the States, is recommended at the same time as having a pap test because it's non-invasive and it identifies a woman that might be at risk for cellular abnormalities that could lead to cancer. But women that are younger, so let's say 21 to 29, and I won't test you on those age ranges exactly, just have an idea of, of the reason I'm saying what I am, is that women between the ages of 21 and 29, if they have an HPV test done, along with their pap test, just at the same time, the HPV test, the problem with that is it could come back as positive but most women are able to clear it out at a young age with an intact immune system. And so what could end up happening is they might remove some of the cells of the cervix, which could impact the overall integrity of the cervix, making future pregnancies potentially a problem. But if a, a woman that's in her, let's say 20, 21 to 29, her pap test comes back abnormal, then an HPV test would likely be done. And this is known as a reflex HPV test. So in a, again, reflex testing is when an HPV test is done only if the pap test is abnormal. A female that has a normal pap test and a normal HPV test have almost no chance of getting cervical cancer within in about at least five years. If they're diagnosed with CIN1 or CIN2, so we'll go back here for a moment, CIN1 or CIN2, this is considered really an early stage of catching it. So this is, is a time, time to catch it if it's already CIN. And then remember that CIN3, these cells are really starting to look very atypical. But pap tests are cheap and and all you need is really, you need your swab, you need, you need a microscope, I guess that's the most expensive component. Someone skilled to actually take, take the cell sample, but also someone skilled in a laboratory observing it. And then the ability, you need the ability to stain these cells. But overall, it's considered a cheap test. And so it is really great for the developing world as a screening tool. 
Here's showing you the differential staining that's done. It's important to have some sort of contrast between the different structures that you're looking at within cells because otherwise they can look very similar and it can be hard to distinguish what is part of that cell and what might be abnormal. So staining is done. I won't ask you the specific questions because this isn't a focused med lab course, but hematoxylin is a stain to look more closely at the, the nucleus. Orange G is used to, is, is a keratin stain and then is in azure is to allow for better observation of the cytoplasm of, of the cell. But again, I won't ask you any questions from this slide. Just be aware that staining is important. As I've already introduced to you, progressive neoplastic changes of cervical cells are classified on this continuum from cervical intraepithelial neoplasia or dysplasia to, to cervical carcinoma in situ, so cancer in place, to invasive carcinoma, meaning that the cancer has invaded the basement, the basement membrane of the tissue. Various terms are used to describe the cellular changes in the cervix based on how the, how the cells were obtained via a pap test. So they, we can describe the cellular changes. Pap tests, though, are really just a screen for cervical cancer. So if a pap test has abnormal findings, then from there, a biopsy would be done of the affected tissue, and then it and, and the biopsy would be taken during a process called colposcopy, which you'll see a couple of slides from now. And it's the biopsy and the, the observation of that tissue that reveals the actual extent of the lesions, lesions within the cervix. So screening is step one then, and colposcopy, as you'll, you'll see soon, is next if something is found. So the Bethesda system is a system for reporting cervical cytologic diagnoses, and it's so used for reporting pap smear results. It was introduced way back in the 80s, I think late 80s. It was revised again. You don't need to know these numbers, but in, in the early 1990s, and then again in 2001. And this actually isn't the most up-to-date up to up chart because it was revised again in 2014. But the, the descriptions for what you need to know is, is relevant within this edition. And just in case you're curious, the, the name Bethesda just came from the location that the conference was held that established this system. Okay, so here we have the PAP classes. We have a description and then additional descriptions using the Bethesda, Bethesda description system. PAP1 is normal. There may be variants that are present, but they're not considered suspicious. So it's considered normal. Then we have PAP2. PAP2, you can see this class, there are different potential descriptions. Reactive changes might be seen. So with reactive changes, there, there could be changes that are seen that are really benign in nature. Maybe there's some inflammation that's present that's showing these reactive changes. Um, it could be maybe an intrauterine device that has irritated the area or other nonspecific causes, but not considered not considered uh, con concerning, considered just benign. And I, in cases like this, monitoring might be a wise choice. Atypia means that atypical cells are identified, or ASC stands for atypical squamous cells or atypical squamous glands are identified. And then another description involves coilocytosis. A colocyte is a, and this is where you should make note at the bottom of the slide, this is a squamous epithelial cell and that has undergone a number of different structural changes. And these structural changes occur as a result of infection by HPV or human papillomavirus. So I'll say that again so you don't have to rewind it. A colocyte is a squamous epithelial cell it's a squamous epithelial cell that has undergone a number of different structural changes, and the structural changes have occurred because of infection by the human papillomavirus. 
So in other words, it's evident then with these cells, these colocytes, that human papillomavirus has infected it and forced structural changes. And this is considered to be a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, squamous intraepithelial lesion. But now we get to the point where we're talking about CIN 1, 2, and 3 within all part of PAP class 3. And just so you're aware, you do need to know much of the detail of this slide. So I'm not going to repeat all of this because we already talked about on a previous slide the details of CIN1 and 2, their description, and even the Bethesda description was also placed on a previous slide, so you can refer back to that. But we're going to skip down now to PAP class 4, which is carcinoma in situ, meaning cancer in place. This is very suspicious and considered a high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. PAP class 5 brings you to invasive carcinoma. So the difference with invasive carcinoma compared to carcinoma in C2 is that it's no longer in place. It's now invading the basement membrane beneath it. And you can see that, that it can also be graded or described based on how deep the invasion is, micro-invasive versus frankly invasive. When dysplasia is detected, then further testing is going to be indicated for diagnosis. Colposcopy involves examining the cervix visually and taking a needed biopsy. An acetic acid solution, or vinegar, is applied to the cervix, making the areas of HPV inf infection stand out in a white color, and this is referred to as acetowhite. The cervix is then viewed under magnification for these acetal-white areas, so looking for them, looking for the, the changes in epithelium and the presence of any abnormal vascular patterns. Any of these abnormal areas, so epithelial tissue that just looks odd, any abnormal vascular patterns, and then certainly the acetal-white area are going to be biopsied. As a woman ages, the, the vulnerable transformation zone actually moves into the cervical, cervical canal, and so the endocervix then needs to be sampled as well in, as women age. So I'm just going to go back to this slide here to show you that the transformation zone as a woman ages, so we have menopausal and postmenopausal, you can see its location here is higher, is within the endocervical canal compared to a, a female that has already had her period. So it sort of moves in this direction and then moves back up again. So you have to make sure that you're sampling the correct area or at least getting enough tissue for sampling. So I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about global epidemiology where we have statistics from the World Health Organization and then we'll look at the cervical cancer rates in Canada. You don't need to know any of the statistics that I'm providing to you, but it just gives you an idea of some of the differences around the world. Cancer of the cervix is the leading cause of cancer-related death in most of Africa, Central America, South Central Asia. There's a, a, a low prevalence in North America. Prevalence is an important word for you to know throughout your studies. It just means the number of cases of a disease that are present in a particular population at a given time. So the number of people with a disease at a given time. And we'll see the term incidence on the next slide, which refers to the number of new cases that are coming up during a given period of time, which can give you an indication of of what your risk is yourself of developing a disease based on the amount of people that are being diagnosed with it at that time. Now, why is there this big, this big change in certain areas of the world? Well, lack of money in certain countries will increase the risk. Money needs to be put into public health, prevention, education, PAP tests, HPV tests, and, and even healthy lifestyle options. Here are the cervical cancer statistics within Canada. Within Canada, it's quite low. There does seem to be a trend from west to east. 
But what is this lower incidence related to? Well, as I just said on, on the last slide, but just the opposite, that in North America and Canada, we have access to public health. We have money is in public health. We have prevention opportunities. We have more opportunities to make better lifestyle choices, more education. The incidence, so remember that's the number of new cases that come up, so it gives you an idea of risk. So number of new cases within a period of time. 550 women per year are being diagnosed with cervical cancer, but you can see that the mortality is not equal to that. It is relatively low, 175 women per year, and that would be because of access to, to treatment. One of the problems with cervical cancer is that it is asymptomatic, as a fair amount of cancers are, as you'll learn about later on in this course. We spoke about squamous cell metaplasia, so columnar cells undergoing metaplasia to become squamous cells. We know that this squamous cell metaplasia can predispose those cells to dysplastic changes. And so the most common type of cervical cancer is called squamous cell carcinoma. You can make note that the second most common type is an adenocarcinoma, and this refers to cancer of glandular tissue. And we'll learn all about that in cancer when we talk about cancer later on. It's been established that cervical cancer is almost exclusively caused by cervical HPV infection, as already mentioned. Most sexually active women will contract HPV at some point in their lifetime. Most of these infections are asymptomatic and most actually resolve spontaneously as I started off our lecture with. In fact, oftentimes it's not even ever discovered. Now the problem though is with high risk HPV, it might persist and not be cleared by the immune system and that it might cause abnormal cellular changes that can become cancerous. I mentioned that HPV strains 16 and 18 are most implicated as causing 70% of all cancers, if not more. So again, 70% of all cervical cancers are caused by HPV strains 16 and 18. Most HPV infections, once again, are cleared by the immune system. The vast majority do not cause cervical cancer. So early testing, let's say under the age of 21, and I did briefly talk about this already, is usually not recommended. And the reason that I had mentioned is because early testing might actually show that that female has HPV, but her immune system very well might have cleared it out anyways. So what it can lead to then, if it comes up as positive, is this unnecessary treatment that can interrupt the integrity of the cervix. And so I mentioned it can lead to issues with pregnancy, meaning that there could be preterm births because the integrity of the cervix is affected. And all in all, this may have not even really reduced the risk of cervical cancer by very much, if at all. Other risk factors for the development of cervical cancer include smoking, which seems to, that'll come up again and again with all the cancers that we talk about. Immunosuppression, anything that affects the immune system can predispose the person to becoming infected with HPV and having it persist. Poor nutrition, early age at first, intercourse, those with multiple sexual partners and a history of, of sexually transmitted diseases, this all can contribute to increasing a person's risk of developing cervical cancer. So for every cancer that exists, we need to know what the risk factors are for cancer. And here we have a list of risk factors for cervical cancer. This will help you understand prevention. If we can educate about multiple sexual partners and early age at first intercourse, if we can educate about good nutrition and keeping the immune system high and not smoking and preventing STDs, all of this could help with the prevention of many different types of cancer. Let's talk specifically though about HPV because we know that, that that's the big one. It takes anywhere from 10 to 30 years for exposure to HPV 16 or 18 to actually cause cancer. And the question is, did the HPV integrate itself into the genome in such a way to cause the cancer? Studies done in North America and Europe where it's actually less there 
lots have been done, but where we need to really look at is the developing world. So looking more at global health. The patterns of HPV are different throughout different areas of the world. HPV 45, so 16 and 18 you recognize down here, but HPV 45 is more prevalent in certain areas of the world. And HPV 45 can also cause cervical cancer. And so in certain areas of the world, if you're vaccinating for HPV uh, strain 16 and 18, well, if 45 is also a problem, then this particular vaccination isn't going to, to necessarily do much good or be as effective. The HPV vaccine targets four strains of HPV. HPV 16 and 18, obviously, but also 6 and 11. So strains 6, 11, 16, and 18 are targeted with the vaccine. Now, we know 16 and 18 are related to cervical cancers, but 6 and 11 it cause about 90% of genital warts. And just for a moment, looking at this image here, this is showing you that HPV can infect the cells of the cervix. And what it does is it incorporates its own DNA into your own DNA, changing really your genome, and that it can lead to cancer over many years. So this is why early screening is important. But as already mentioned as well, and you don't need to know the statistic here, the majority will heal within two years. Okay, that is the end of today's lecture. Thank you for listening.